Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and I will be your course instructor for this uh, course on understanding contemporary art. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of art in this lecture course, um, and one of the uh, main textbook, the, the main textbook actually that we'll be using is my book, Art After Metaphysics. Uh, so be sure to get a copy of this, or to uh, you can go onto Google Play and you can download an audiobooks version, or there will be a Kindle books version also. There should be anyway available. Um, so that'll be the main text that we'll be following uh, in this lecture course. And what I want to do, um, the first thing that we need to look at is to try to understand the essence of contemporary art. But every epoch of art is best understood by juxtaposing it with an epoch that precedes it. Uh, and of course, this could lead to an endless chain going all the way back to the Paleolithic caves, and we don't have time to go back quite that far. Uh, so what I do want to do is begin before looking at contemporary art proper is to review the main developments of modernist art, um, beginning especially with Manet. But before we even do that, I do want to take a glance at a couple of images here from the period of what the Swiss philosopher Jean Gebser calls perspectival art. This is uh, to say the age in which uh, art, the rules of art were worked out in terms of three-dimensional depth perspective. And in this image that we're looking at here from uh, 1455, this is a Renaissance image, Montaigne's execution, of St. James, uh, we're looking at a what would be ca called a correct, a perspectively correct image. Uh, we see the triumphal arch there, and we're looking at this image from the point of view of one single person. So that's the key thing about perspectival art, uh, art in the grand age of the Renaissance and the Reformation, Counter-Reformation, and the Baroque, uh, and the Neoclassical and Romantic periods which follow it. Uh, they're all bound together by the fact that uh, we have the rise of visual uh, visual space, what uh, Marshall McLuhan called visual space, uh, which is realistic space, three-dimensional space, and it's already being figured out in the 15th century by uh, the great Renaissance artists uh, who lay the groundwork for what then in the 17th century, 17th century will be worked out mathematically by, by Descartes um, as uh, mathematical phase space with his analytic geometry with the X, Y, and Z coordinate axes. Um, all of that will be worked out. So we have this idea now that space, uh, and this isn't the correct way to represent space. A lot of people make the mistake of assuming that this is how we see. It isn't how we see. It's a way of seeing. It's a way we learn how to see. And each one of these epochs of art has a different way in which a culture and a people have been bound together uh, in a kind of consensus agreement on ways of seeing. And this way of representing things in uh, three-dimensional space is... Uh, Part of this epoch. And here we have next, we have Caravaggio's uh, crucifixion of St. Peter. And you can see that it's got a kind of dynamical uh, three-dimensionality to it, as though you were watching a movie. His, If it were in 3D, his legs would be sticking out, and Caravaggio plays that up here. Um, and if we move right along to Velasquez's uh, Las Meninas, we can also see how things are put into a single homogeneous spatial container that is subject to a single point of view that has uh, a vanishing point on the horizon line. And the vanishing point here terminates somewhere uh, in the back there where the guy is either entering the room or leaving it. Um, and then here with Vermeer's Milkmaid, we see this sort of natural, a depth perspectival way of seeing. It, it appears to be very naturalistic, a very uh, realistic, uh, naturalistic orientation of things, all, sh all sharing the same common space. So we have a single space in which objects are placed inside of it. And so they're all sharing the same space. And that's the key thing to understand about perspectival art that you need to understand when we shift to uh, the beginnings of Impressionism. And with um, the beginning with Impressionism, we are now shifting into the epoch of modernism proper. And I want to look at Manet's painting here, the 1862 Music in the Tuileries. Um, this is about the, the very earliest beginnings of the disintegration of depth perspective in painting that marks modernist art with a rupture. A threshold has been crossed here. Now, if you look at this painting, one of the things that you notice about it is that there's no clear vanishing point. We're not exactly sure where the vanishing point is, and we're not exactly sure where the, where the horizon line is. There are no straight x-axes. Uh, all the trees are tilted and leaning. All the men's stovepipe hats are tilted and leaning. And so there's a kind of curvature that Manet gives to the space, and it has a sort of single texture about it. What we're going to see, we're still in three-dimensional space here, but what we're, what's going to happen is that 
objects are beginning to break off from this idea of space as a single homogeneous container, and pretty soon each object is going to be inside of its own space, moving at its own time relative to each other object, and eventually, with modernist art, it'll essentially culminate and finish, uh, reach its telos with the creation of what, uh, what I would term the hyperdimensional object, and we'll see in the next uh, lecture what that means. So um, moving on with uh, a very sensational painting here, Manet's Le Déjeuner sur l'Herbe of 1863. Uh, this is not a, correct, a prospectively correct painting at all. The woman that's in the far background bending over, if she were prospectively correct, would have to be a nine foot tall giant in order for this to work. So she's in a different space from uh, the characters in the foreground. And uh, though this is based on uh, a, a painting done by Giorgione, and then a riff on it done by Raphael, uh, it doesn't really have, uh, it's not connected to a narrative. And so the reason that it created such a scandal when it came out at the time is because the naked woman is there and the naked woman has been all through art, one of the great uh, icons of art going all the way back to the Paleolithic caves with the great mother. But here she's just sort of casually on the grass out in the open in the public talking to two clothed men who might be having a philosophical discussion, but there's no narrative. To, to contextualize it. There's no sense that this is part of a story or an ancient myth or anything like that. Manet is really the first, under the influence of his friend Baudelaire, to begin to dispense with historical meta-narratives or historical narratives of any kind. We don't find biblical themes in Manet's art, except for one or two paintings of, of the life of Christ. Uh, there's only a couple of them. But for the most part, uh, we were just look, we're strolling through the city streets of Paris, and we are looking out upon Paris with the eyes of the flaneur, uh, which is another one of Baudelaire's great archetypes. The flaneur uh, is the street walker, the one who casually walks up and down the streets and sees the city and is simply looking, strolling, and enjoying the city. This is the consciousness of the city now, and it's a very ahistorical type of consciousness. The French are really the first to do this, and they inaugurate modernism by creating a rupture, <clears throat> by cutting us free from uh, biblical narratives, Greek myths, and historical anecdotes. And here in this next painting by Manet, we have Olympia, and here she is, uh, the great nude, represented <clears throat> in dialogue with paintings like uh, Velázquez's Venus with a Mirror, or Titian's, one of Titian's uh, various Venuses. Uh, and here she is, she's a prostitute, and she's gazing frankly at you, the viewer, who are the, her caller, who has walked into the room and is now seeing her. Uh, but notice that the space is beginning to kind of, it's got a flatness about it. And we're going to see the flatness getting flatter and flatter as we progress through these paintings. Here now is a very interesting painting. We have Manet's boating. And here now what I said is was going to happen is beginning to happen. We can see this is boating from about 1874. Uh, there's no horizon line in this image at all. Manet has eliminated the horizon line, and it creates a sense of disorientation in the viewer. You're not sure where you're at here. You're in a boat, certainly, but you don't know where you're at in relation to anything else. And so what we can begin to see here with modernist art is that spaces are beginning to break free of other spaces. They're beginning to move off and break free into worlds of their own. Um, and then so moving right along here to Monet's painting. This is 1870, uh, Train in the Countryside. This, once again, is the city consciousness looking out at the world um, in the countryside. Even when the uh, Impressionist painters leave Paris and they go out into the countryside, they are very much taking that consciousness of the city with them out into the countryside. It's an ahistorical art that is rooted only in the here and now. There's just a constant sense of the moment and not a sense, really, of a historical past in this kind of an art. And here we have Monet's painting uh, in the train station at Gare Saint Lazare of 1877, uh, with the steam filling up the greenhouse effect of the station. The world interior of capital is beginning to form here. The world is a gigantic greenhouse that is the creation of modernizing machinery. And here we have Monet's uh, <coughs> sunset <coughs> impression, or impression sunrise rather, which gave to the whole movement of, of impressionism its name. And the key thing about it here to note is that it's very sketchy. Uh, it has an unfinished quality to it, um, and modern art has a kind of, uh, it is that way, it has this unfinished quality to it, but it also has a very flat treatment of space, and you can start to see the forms here uh, that are sort of flattening out and disintegrating. And if we move on to Kaibot's uh, Paris uh, rainy day of 1877, that's the essence of what I was talking about previously with the flaneur, the one who is strolling along the city streets, 
um, without a care in the world except for the consciousness of the city itself. That's the essence of modernism. It's a very city-oriented Parisian uh, contemporary kind of art. But now modernism phase two begins to shift uh, with Van Gogh's The Sower. And I think what we'll do uh, is we'll pause at this point. We'll end this video here. And what we'll do with the next video is move into uh, modernism phase two, where we'll begin with the south of France and look at the works of Van Gogh and uh, Gauguin and Cezanne.